cognitively and affectively engaging. So making students think and, and being interesting and engaging and, and making them feel, I thought were important things for, for lower level materials. Um, students need opportunities for meaningful language use. There were occasions in the course books that I was using where I'd look at a whole unit and there wasn't much in the way of sort of meaningful interaction and dialogue. Uh, I wanted to see, I wanted, or I wanted to have actually, opportunities to give learners feedback on their language use. <coughs> Though very often that was in quite a, a controlled setting. And I also wanted, and have always wanted, um, at any level, is to help students make genuine discoveries about language. And that wasn't really happening. Now, some of you will have seen, who've seen me speak before, will have seen the next couple of slides. Don't worry, it's not the same talk. It's, it's different material. But it's similar things. Um, but yes, Richards talks about, naturally, there are fewer opportunities for low levels to engage in, in sort of dialogue, dialogue and talk. And that's partly down to the level. We, we have to accept the fact that low level students, they don't have less to say, but they don't have the means to say it so much. Um, but apart from level, I think there are aspects of course book material that prevent this from happening. Um, the Comprehension questions. I'm going to talk about lots of comprehension questions today and introduce some snazzy new acronyms to the ELT world. We need more acron acronyms, I think. Um, discrete items of grammar. Um, I should have put on here not just discrete items of grammar, but the linear approach of course books. I'll make you guess what the, the, some of the material I show you, I'll make you guess what the previous units were. Uh, uh, practice activities, or more specifically, controlled practice activities. Uh, these are, I think, the areas that very often stop students making genuine discoveries about language. And it's comprehension questions, though, is going to be my main focus. Because I think these are perhaps the biggest issue I see in low-level materials at the moment. Um, and I found this, this nice... Anyone recognise the film? It is, yes. And, and a nice, I'm sorry my responses are limited, you must ask the right question. And I think that is what's happening with lower level materials or lower level teaching in general. Because studies are saying that it's not just course books, it's teachers too. We're not asking students the right questions. Um, some problems with uh, comprehension questions. By the way, you are going to have a lot of work to do. You're going to, it's kind of workshoppy, but I'd like to give a bit of background. Um, quite a few problems with comprehension questions. Firstly, they don't engage students with the content. Um, the students are very often not asked to say what they feel about what they've just read or listened to. They're very often just finding facts, figures, dates, those kinds of things. So that limits the amount of affective engagement that students have in material. Um, they're not particularly cognitively demanding. Two studies, Diane Freeman, uh, Lancaster University, not Diane Larson Freeman, but Diane Freeman's study from 2014 and Michel and Timis showing that the majority of comprehension questions in course books in general are set at the sort of lowest rung of Bloom's taxonomy. So that's the, that's the symbol for Bloom's taxonomy as a teacher. Um, so it's at the sort of understanding, lower, lower rung. So they're not really being made to think so much, which is problematic. Um, this is the one I think is the big issue and, and the kind of thing I'm, I'm quite interested in researching at the moment. Answers are all pre-chosen by the writer of the material. So that every student, whether they are teenagers in Brazil or adults in Thailand, they are, whatever they read, they are all tasked with finding the same answer. Um, even though they may have completely different reactions to the content of text, they are all finding the same answer. So there's not much agency for the student, and there's not much agency for the teacher either. Um, they encourage a testing procedure. 
and, and so every time I talk about these, this stuff or moan about this stuff more accurately, uh, someone will always say, yes, but what about the tests we have to do? Well, okay, yes, comprehension questions, if that's what's in the test, that's what you've got to do. But the interesting thing about testing procedure is studies again show that students aren't getting, the, they don't actually make students better readers. You can get better answering comprehension questions without becoming a better reader. But also, it doesn't give any evidence for why students are good at comprehension questions or not. So students can get everything right without actually understanding a text. Or they can get everything wrong whilst basically understanding what the person is saying. So they don't really tell us what students have actually understood. Um, they can also lead to text processing weaknesses. Again, it's another study showing that students are kind of getting to intermediate level, or the students in this study, perhaps more accurately, getting to sort of an intermediate level, and their reading skills haven't really improved, or their ability to question texts hasn't really improved. They're able to answer questions, but they're not able to know what a writer is doing, or what the general message is or to question or infer. So there are quite a lot of problems with comprehension questions. Um, oh yeah, little diagnostic value. They don't really tell you what your student is good at or not, apart from answering comprehension questions, which isn't a skill they would use in the real world except in exams, which we have to accept is, is part of what we do now. Um, so I'm going to run through a little study, introduce some lovely new acronyms. Um, comprehension questions, very, very common. Um, in course books, you'll often get language questions. A language question in a course book might be something like, um, um, which verb is used to? Or listen to the recording, do they say this or these? So it's very much linked, related to probably a grammar or phonology or lexical presentation that's about to come. Uh, the other one, and this is where the acronyms get good, are evaluative questions. So you've got uh, reading evaluative questions and listening evaluative questions, LEQs. <coughs> Next one you'll love. Um, these are kind of things like, what should they do? Or why do you think they did that? Or what do you think will happen? Those kinds of questions. And the last ones are personal response questions. So for listening, LPRQs. Great acronym. Um, those are things like, what would you do? Or would you do this? Does this sound fun? Does this sound nice? Um, so four types of questions. I did a uh, very scientific study, um, very detailed research. I sat in a room with a pen and counted questions in a well-known course book. And this is what I found. Um, you have, the, the blue ones are comprehension questions. Uh, left side is reading, uh, right side is listening. Uh, you can see that comprehension questions far outnumber the other types of question. The next highest, listening here, that's, I, I think that's a good thing. That, that, so in this course book, there's a lot of listening and asking what they heard. So which word is used. So it's things like have and has, am, are, is. Lots of good decoding stuff. But if you look at uh, evaluative questions, or personal response questions, they're hardly used at all compared to the other types of question. So students at this lower level with this course book are kind of getting a diet of mainly comprehension questions. Uh, take out language related questions that don't deal with content so much and you can actually, it's actually more stark. Uh, I think it's 86% of questions in this particular series which has just been updated about two weeks ago, um, you can see that comprehension questions far, far outnumber uh, other types of questions, the ones that are more likely to make students think and feel. Um, yes, 80% of questions are comprehension questions, and this is, it, it shows that actually it's not just in, not just in comprehension, uh, just not in text, it's teachers in general at lower levels asking these sort of questions that don't encourage much interaction, much, much thought. It's a yes or no answer, true or false answer, one right answer. So I think that that's problematic. 
Um, and in this course book, out of the 88 texts, students are actually only able to, to interact with 28 of them. So that's 60 texts where they, they just move on. They read it and they move on. Probably, perhaps, they, they look at the grammar in it, or the lexis in it, or, or some aspect of phonology. So, um, yeah, I've got some guests who've created some of this, uh, um, some of these materials. I'm going to tell you a little tale, or we're going to do a workshop, where there are going to be three different teachers and three different texts, all taken from Speak Out uh, Elementary. Um, Obviously, I'm slightly showing off about my travelling of late. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Barcelona. Last week, in Ireland. Both times, I did a, syllable, a, a similar talk where the creators of Speak Out came in to the talk. Um, but I would always do this caveat anyway. The reason I keep going on about Speak Out is they do have good texts. So if the texts weren't good, I wouldn't be able to talk about the flaws in the material. But it is because I'm using the book that I'm able to use Speak Out. Uh, I'm not singling them out as a bad textbook. Um, so could you have a look? Um, thank you for letting me use the... Use, I won't say who it is. She's giggling over there somewhere. Um, one of the lessons in the course book was about um, big families. Okay, I would just like you to... I don't know what my task is actually. Let me have a look at my... Ah, yes, okay, no. Before we go on, uh, these are the activities in the book. So the text is about big families, families of sort of 17, 18, with, with 17 or 18 children. And you've got sort of typical course book activities like this one. You know, what does the number relate to? We've all seen that kind of activity. Um, it's a jigsaw reading, by the way, which I think is a good thing, because you then get the information, gap, you get the information exchange. But notice, in the first task, they are only finding figures. They're not really looking much at the content of the text. And then they're just deciding who does and doesn't do certain things. So the Lewis family don't all live together, you, it, or, or live together. Quite low level sort of cognitive challenge. And there were no personal response questions or evaluative questions. I've only used one text, by the way, um, because I, well, not me, the person who did the lesson. Um, <laughs> they only used one text, um, and I think that was a good idea. Um, so two questions. The first question uh, is, would you like to be part of a family like this? This was the question that the teacher asked the students. Okay, so just quickly read the text. Would you like to be part of a family like this? How many rooms? Okay, okay. I do like using an elementary text with a load of teachers because they seem to sort of quite get into it. That was a nice noise. That was a good classroom noise. Um, now, actually, I, I, I would like you to answer another question, but quick show of hands. Who would like to live in a family like this? Any, yeah. any, any reasons? Any, <coughs> any reasons? Oh, my. Sorry? Right, okay. Very, very nice. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I could push you on why you've given that, that answer. Um, I'm going to give you another quick speaking activity. The second question is, now obviously that was probably about two or three minutes of you guys having a pretty decent conversation, uh, either about the text or something else. I don't know actually because it's quite noisy. Um, but what do you think are the advantages of asking this kind of question? And what do you think would happen in an elementary class? Would they cope with this kind of question? The answer is obviously yes, but um, why? Uh, yeah, what do you think? Why? What are the advantages of asking this type of question? And what would you expect from elementary students, lower level students? Off you go again. Yes. Do you teach lower levels or? Yeah. Any thoughts? What might be the advantages of an activity like or a question like this? Everyone's got an opinion. 
something. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. Yeah. No prior knowledge needed. Yeah, yeah. Now, there's a, obviously a danger that the student won't read the text. I don't find that. Um, there's a danger you have students who won't read it, especially yeah. perhaps if they're teens. So you might have to create an extra activity where they have to underline good things and bad things if you've got those kinds of students. But yeah. Yeah, yeah. But then I think I guess if you did that you run the risk of they don't read the text. But uh, yeah, so I, I found that the students do read the text. Um, but I guess what I've been told is that perhaps with some younger learners, teens perhaps, they're more likely to answer without reading the text. So you do have to think about a way of doing that. Yeah. Right. I'm. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to get feedback from you. But from my monitoring, um, we were talking about the fact that students can kind of say what they feel. They're going to give quite short answers. But you guys said you could do something with them. You can reformulate. You can expand. Uh, and and we were talking about the fact there's no right. Is that what you, sort of no right answer? No right. No right. Yeah. Yeah. They they kind of can say what they want. There is of course a danger. This isn't something I felt with our class, and, and you might feel it too. They did read the texts. They did spend time but, um, reading the text. But I've been told by other students, or it's been said by sorry, other teachers, um, they've said, well, how do you ensure that the student reads the text? If you've got those kind of students, you might do an activity where you get them to underline good things and bad things perhaps. So if you do have the, those students who perhaps would try and answer without reading, then you're going to have to do something about that. But it's not been a problem I've observed. Um, for me, I think the, the beauty of an activity like this, a personal response task like this, is the kind of answer you get. Um, so if you knew this student, uh, I can hear her in my head. She's quite dramatic. Uh, Colombian? Chilean? I can't remember where she was. Oh my God, no, too many people. You know, uh, that's the kind of sort of thing she would say. Um, I like this one. You, it's, big, it's really thinking, oh, yeah, interesting. Because uh, wh why do you think he's given that answer? Or why do you think he's having that thought? <laughs> well, well, they, they, they to do it together. yeah, and so he's just thinking of the size of the table. Mm -hmm. I, I quite, I quite like that. So again, it's, it's, he's turning a personal response task into something a little more evaluative, um, and then taking it a little bit further. Uh, well, they, <laughs> so obviously, at his level, he can't talk about the fact. Oh, there must be quite long queues for the bathroom, or they, they probably should have a bathroom. You know, he can't sort of say that, so he, all of his linguistic resources come out, I need the bathroom, I need the bathroom. You'll see a bit later in the next activity, a little bit bathroom obsessed, this class. Um, now, but the other thing about personal response questions is you allow students to kind of be themselves. This is a class that was quite, um, a lot of the students were from uh, Latin American countries. I think we had Ecuadorian, Chilean, Colombian, Venezuelan, uh, Brazilian, and and so actually they they had a, they had views about this. This student was um, a grandmother, um, but I quite like this this answer. <laughs> and notice she's sort of able to use her first language to nietos is. Yeah, she's able to use her first language to kind of to make her, um, her views uh, known. And I thought this one was very interesting, especially when you think about the sort of the short answer. Now, this is an approximation of what he said, but... A couple of people have said they're not quite sure what he's trying to say. What he was saying here is that, you know, his brother has an idea and it's like, oh, we're all doing that. So everyone does kind of the same thing. If someone says, let's do this, they all kind of do it together. Now, thinking your knowledge of, of textbooks, what do you imagine is the language focus of this unit? It's not present simple, no. It's, it's a, it's have, yeah, it's have got, has got, have got. And uh, family vocabulary. And they're already using the language in the tasks that you can cut out. 
So you've got the family tree and filling in who's who in the family tree and using have and has got. But actually, why wait? The students are already, you're already seeing which words and phrases the students need through the activity. So actually you can turn a personal response question into kind of like a task that helps you work with the language. So actually what Jose has done here, I has, there's the perfect thing to now introduce I've got. You're, you're striking while the iron is hot, as it were, rather than following up the text with a gap fill. Have you got any brothers and sisters? They're already having the discussion. So it, it seems a little bit, it makes it a little bit unnecessary. And again, work in pairs, exchange family trees with your partner. Actually, looking at some of those families, they would have taken, some of those students would have taken quite a long time <laughs> to make their family trees. And they're actually getting a lot more out of the discussion. You've got these ideas of busy, bustling houses coming out of quite minimal language resources because of the question that the teacher asked. Um, by, this, by the way, this was a teacher uh, who has done half their CELTA. So this is a teacher working in the first three hours of teaching and, and coping with this kind of interaction very, very well. Obviously, I'm noting down a lot of the language and we'll, we talk about it, um, but you can make it happen as a new as a new teacher. Okay, um, right, um, yeah, so why, the other reason going into, so we've talked about the dialogue, what about the sort of, the discussion bit, what about the discovery bit? Learners are predisposed to notice language features relevant to the task they have performed. Lots of writers saying this. So again, why wait for the book to introduce the language when you can work with what students produce? And um, the idea of noticing the gap in your, in your current sort of interlanguage. It's a good way of working. And I believe it's a very, very good way of wor working with elementaries because it's constant. And a lot of what they say is ungrammatical. So we've got plenty, plenty to work with. Um, all these slides, uh, all this will be available, by the way. I've got a, a link at the end of the talk. Okay, second one, one of my favorite texts ever. I'm going to have to retire it because the second edition has come out. Could you have a look at the two tasks on this handout? And again, this time perhaps more about the person, about the evaluation task. What do you think of it? What, what's, why is it quite a decent task? I'm going to do, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look at, look at what the students were saying, the kind of things that the students were saying. Um, now, these are the comprehension questions in the book. Um, the Ausbus travels through 12 countries in 20 weeks. True or false? <laughs> yeah. yeah, good, good, good. What I've, what I've found, and I, I wish I could remember what this other teacher said, they talked about the, the intonation of the true or false question. And it's that they went false, true, true. And, and so you can see that that's clearly not engaging students. I wish I knew who'd said it so I could record them saying it. So again, you've, you've got this lack of sort of engagement and, and cognitive challenge. The good thing is the, the book does ask this question. So we, we, we did use the question in the book. Um, and in a one-hour lesson, we got nine minutes of responses uh, from this um, task. Edema, again, you, again, I told you she's quite dramatic. <laughs> and again, I said the bathroom-obsessed class. Um, I need my bathroom only for me. Um, so again, yeah, but, but now, by the way, Edema, I think, was, was by the end of this four weeks together, she was the kind of student who felt very ready to, to move up. Um, Mohammed was um, one of the few non-Spanish speakers in the group um, and, and did speak in very, very fractured sentences which, which can really throw a lot of teachers. They sort of say, oh, he doesn't make proper sentences. It's really hard to... But no, I, he doesn't like it because people fall asleep and start snoring. You know, that's, that's actually saying a lot. There, there's plenty happening there. And he's using his, his miming snoring to do it. Um, this task I really like. I stole this from a teacher called Roy, um, who is in the first half of his CELTA. They're, they're students on an MAT source, so they've done three hours of teaching practice. They've got another three hours to go. I think this guy, Roy, has an eye for materials design. 
Um, and he invented this activity for another activity. So that's what good trainers do. They just steal teachers' <laughs> lessons. So I did. Um, but I added me because I thought that would be, I thought that would get the students. By the way, what do you think? Would I? Would I go on this or yes. not? Yes. No chance. <laughs> Twelve weeks sharing a toilet. No, no way. Ah. Oh, no. I can imagine it'd be quite yeah, uncomfortable. Um, but I like this because it was sort of made by committee. So this was suggested to me to have a single female traveller so that anybody could sort of say, yeah, but why female? Why not male? What's, what's the... You know, you actually create lots of opportunities by having these types of questions. Uh, this was a 15-minute activity pair work and open class feedback so 25 minutes of a one hour lesson given over to dialogue and response to the text um, here are some responses um, again you can see how the first language is is coming into play via yeah. meaning yeah absolutely yeah um, who can guess what the previous unit the the this lesson, yeah. So this lesson is supposed to be about superlatives. The previous unit was about comparatives. So this idea of that you learn one form and then move on, you're ready to move on for the next one. Not really. You know, you don't learn comparatives in one lesson and are ready for superlatives. It's all still a sort of mess. And so it's quite nice that you could, you're bringing in other language points to explore. This is my favourite response. <laughs> I just want to be alone with my phone. <laughs> um, two friends is the best. By the way, they're supposed to do an activity looking at the best later, but they're already using the best. Why do you think students at elementary working, living in London are able to use the best? It's all, yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, they see it all the time. It's, it's probably a phrase they pick up really, really quickly. Um, and I quite, this one I sort of struck me because Johnny was sort of arguing for the fact that um, he would go on this trip with his mum. He said his mum was his best friend and, you know, quite a sort of impassioned, oh yeah, quite a sort of impassioned uh, discussion about his mum. Now, in terms of sort of discovery, I quite like asking lower level students why we are using a certain form. So in the families lesson a few days before and in this lesson we're getting them to use wood. Um, and this is what Edima said. <laughs> so that's the grammar done. We've done the grammar, yeah, they understand the grammar. Uh, it's not really done because obviously we've got a student called Muhammad and a student called Hannah who was Turkish, who, who didn't speak. So my job is to ask students to explain. And here are the explanations, the reasons that the students gave. Um, it's the future that you like to do, but it's in my mind. It's pretty nice, huh? And Johnny's, ah, it's just an opinion. <laughs> and he's absolutely right. The students are quite comfortable using wood, which was not introduced until much later in the course book. They're already playing with superlatives and comparatives. They don't need this sort of step-by-step -step introduction of separate language points because they're letting things, they, they can do things already with language and we can, we can work with that. Uh, the last bit, by the way, is again going back to Roy. This happened before this lesson. Um, this is another problem with elementary course book texts. Um, just, if I walked past this restaurant, I wouldn't go in it, you know, with its cheese, egg and chicken sandwiches choice. Um, so Roy even decided that sometimes the texts at elementary level were limiting the kind of dialogue and discussion you could have. So he invented Danny's Cafe, which you'll, uh, you probably can't see, but it does lobster. Um, that is quite a, and actually also has more choice of teas. Um, and this is where I got, he got the activity from. What would you like to eat and drink? Nice personal response question. And look at the menu. Will the following people be happy with the menu? Families with children, vegetarians, people who eat meat. You know, he's, he's, he's creating an interaction with the material that isn't actually there. Oh, of course the activity is about could I have type things, but 
why not get students interacting early with okay it's not authentic as a text but he's authenticating it by by help making students interact no oh, we can't go there because Edim is a vegetarian that sort of thing um, yeah so my conclusion um, how long have I got okay I've got about three minutes I think limit comprehension questions I, I think yes of course if you're teaching an exam class you're gonna have to train them in exam skills but if you want students to interact with what you're doing with the material you're using in the classroom these questions don't do it for me and and I watch a lot of teaching and it they don't do it for lots of teachers it, there's a little bit of a sort of performance of set tasks get the answers move on a little bit um, ask more evaluative questions and personal response questions so students can interact with the text and pinch yourself if it's going on longer than you planned don't stop it just think okay this is good I can work with this um, and if you're new at teaching or you're new at lower levels or working with emerging language kind of bothers you at this stage of your career then put a dictaphone or phone around some tables and record it and listen to it and think okay what could I focus on tomorrow with the students what what language was interesting so I think recording tasks is a great idea the the Ausbus task was recorded so I was able to pick out all that uh, while I was afterwards and the um, families lesson I was the observer uh, Hong Xing was teaching the lesson so I was able to note down what students were saying because I'm not having to deal with monitoring and checking students are doing things right and um, and yeah so work with what emerges from discussions um, and you can also explore language through tasks as well as text don't wait for the the language discovery activity to appear in the book <coughs> work with what's happening around you so in a way personal response questions evaluative questions they become task like um, all the slides will be here um, they are under a different heading I think it's it's from the English UK conference this year you'll see the exact same set of slides and materials oh no the materials aren't there because they're not mine they're from a course book uh, but they're on the slide um, and you can email me if you have any questions there's a bibliography on the next set page as well if anyone okay wine and cheese for 15 minutes I guess all right I'm here for questions if you have